Welcome back to the Asia Pacific Perspective. I'm your co-host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm your other co-host, Brock West from APPerspective.net. And James, I wanted to start this month's episode off with a problem. And it's a major problem that I know you personally have spent countless hours exposing and pointing out to your audience. I'm, of course, talking about the problem of crazy conspiracy theorists going on and on about New World Order this, New Financial Order that. I used to live with the security that these vile and disturbing individuals were mainly confined to the borders of the United States and Europe. But sadly, it seems that these tinfoil hat wearing nut jobs had found their way into positions of power right here in the Asia Pacific. I mean, here, just take a look at this article from Reuters with the headline reading, Asian and African nations challenge obsolete world order. Leaders of Asian and African nations have called for a new global order that is open to emerging economic powers and leaves the obsolete ideas of Bretton Woods institutions in the past. Their calls came at the, at the opening of a meeting of Asian and African nations in Jakarta to mark the 60th anniversary of a conference that made a developing world stand against colonialism and led to the Cold War era's non-aligned movement. Indonesian Pre- President Joko Widodo, the conference host, said that those who still insisted that global economic problems could only be solved through the World Bank, IMF and Asian Development Bank were clinging to obsolete ideas. Quote, there needs to be a change, he said. It's imperative that we build a new international economic order that is open to new emerging and economic powers. The IMF and World Bank were at the centre of the post-World War II monetary order created by the US and Europe at the Bretton Woods Conference in New Hampshire in 1944. Indonesia invited heads of state and government from 109 Asian and African countries, but according to a conference official, only 21 leaders turned up, with commentators uh, having said that the group now shows no, uh, waning relevance. So, James, I, I guess the only good thing to come out of this crazy conspiracy theorist conference is that it had such a poor turnout, and luckily and thankfully it hasn't spread through the entire region just yet, I'm so relieved to see that the rest of the major players in the Asia Pacific are busy getting on with their jobs that they were elected by the good people of the region to do, and they're not lowering lowering themselves to such pathetic standards. As we can see here in these other articles, New Asian Bank will enhance, not replace, international finance system. AIIB, a useful complementary tool for the financial world order. The New Asian Bank and and a New World Order. And at the top of my non-conspiratorial readings is this one from nationalinterest.org. China's AIIB Bank, part of a much bigger master plan, which uh, this article goes on to give an overview to the Honourable and and Venerable Henry Kissinger's latest book, the title of which is World Order. So as you can see, James, luckily this intolerable, deluded way of thinking is confined to the insignificant heads of states and meetings, and it's not repeated across countless media outlets. So James, what what are your thoughts on this disturbing turn of events? What are my thoughts? My thoughts are that uh, it boggles my mind. It truly boggles my mind that people still write me trying to convince me that China and the BRICS nations are going to be the saviors of humanity in this coming international world order that they are admittedly on the books trying to create and construct. It is so ridiculous on its face to me that I hope people can understand that when they say they want to replace the obsolete world order with their new financial world order and the AIIB and all of these institutions are going to be backing it up, I hope they understand that that's what they really mean. They really are constructing a new world order from the destruction of the old world order, Pax Americana. And Uh, People sometimes say, well, uh, at least China isn't going around invading other countries. No, that's because they're too busy colonizing their own people. And I have a very disturbing article that I'm going to throw in as a a related here. Um, China rates its own citizens, including online behavior. The Chinese government is currently implementing a nationwide electronic system called the Social Credit System, attributing to each of its 1.3 billion citizens a score for his or her behavior. The system will be based on various criteria, ranging from financial credibility and criminal record to social media behavior. From 2020 onwards, each adult citizen should, besides his identity, card have such a credit code. 
So this is just another disturbing aspect of what's going on in China in the Chinese Communist Party. Surprise, surprise, is not the savior of freedom and, and the proponents of freedom around the world. They are just going to try to enslave their own population as much as possible and get everyone else ensnared in their financial net. This is not the answer to the New World Order that we are looking for. The answer, of course, that I've talked about many, many times involves peer-to-peer -peer economy, decentralization, spontaneous order, anarchism, getting away from these systems of control as much as possible rather than putting our faith in another government to take over this. So, uh, so again, lots of different data points here for people to explore. Don't look for the saviors of humanity to be just another government that's trying to repress its citizens. Exactly. Well said. I mean, all this does, it really, it, it continues to play into that two-dimensional, three-dimensional chessboard that you've so brilliantly pointed out uh, in the past. And, and we will uh, touch on that in our third and final segment for today, James. But quickly, let's move on to our second story for this month. And uh, this past April here, April 25th, almost every Australian and his dog were up at dawn commemorating the uh, 100th anniversary of the landing and subsequent massacre that took place at Gallipoli in World War I. Uh, with the headline reading, Don't Rock the Boat on the Anzac Tradition, Freedom of Speech is All Well and Good Until You Attack Our Most Revered War Commemoration, we'll take this article from the Sydney Morning, Morning Herald of all places. Quote, it doesn't, pay, it doesn't pay to question the orthodoxy in this country, as Scott McIntyre, formerly of, of SBS, an Australian TV network, found out the hard way this past weekend. His career was the latest victim of, as he termed it, the cultification of Anzac, which has likewise claimed our sense of historical perspective and freedom of speech. In 2006, the late author Christopher Hitchens delivered what now is regarded as something of a classic lecture on free speech. The broader point Hitchens made in that speech was that history is so often taught in such a way that country students are made to swallow an official and unalterable story about what took place. The heretic who dares to question that official line does not just have the right to speak, their speech should be given extra protection because what he has to say must have taken him some effort to come up with and might contain a grain of historical truth. And so it surely goes to the legend of the Anzacs, whose heroism and bravery is inculcated at, in, uh, inculcated at every school across the land, and whose honour we toast religiously at this time each year. There tends to be some introspection for sure about the glorification of war mostly, but within narrow, comfortable parameters. Nothing truly contrarian is ventured, no boats are rocked. McIntyre, a sports journalist, learned rather quickly about the outer limits of those parameters. His tweets made some upsetting suggestions that perhaps Australian involvement in World War I was unjustified, that some so soldiers Australia dispatched to several parts of the world have, become, have been less than ethical in their conduct, and that a commemoration of Gallipoli has, to some extent, become a day of drinking and gambling bathed in crass nationalism. So James, this article goes on from there to make some interesting points about this series of events regarding the firing of this uh, sports journalist. It, it, it firstly... It should be pointed out that these tweets were called out and exposed by none other than Federal Communications Minister Malcolm Turnbull, who apparently upon reading uh, McIntyre's tweets was so appalled and disgusted that he personally got in contact with the chief of the SBS network, which of course is partly funded by the government here, and butter bing, butter boom, what do you know, McIntyre's out of a job the next morning. It really says to me how vital it is that the state maintains this perfect aura about the ANZAC at all times, and anyone who dares speak again who speaks out against the validity of the conflicts we've been involved in, or even worse, some of the unethical actions of some but not all of our servicemen, it will not and cannot be tolerated at any given time. Because if we start to bring those types of elements into the conversation you know, of our own wartime atrocities, then the narrative of this brave and heroic diggers fighting the good fight is suddenly not so squeaky clean. So. This is the absolute worst case scenario for any war loving nation and to have the full realities of our country's military actions at the forefront of the public's mind, it all of a sudden becomes increasingly more difficult to sell your, your, your reasons of why we need to go and join the next war or conflict. James, what are your thoughts on this and you know, the, the, the deifying of military actions uh, in, in the past? Well, sadly, that phenomenon is not specifically Australian. It is worldwide. It's, uh, it's everywhere. And of course, I had the same type of indoctrination as a Canadian youth, thinking about the heroic exploits of Canadian military around the world and the wonderful U uh, UN peacekeeping missions where they, uh, they kidnap and uh, brutalize little boys and things like that. Oh, oh, well, that's not Canadian military. That's, that's, that's different. That's a few bad apples. Well, um, 
Okay, there's so much to say about this, but I guess to get, I'd rather get your perspective, obviously, being there in Australia. I've been reading the online discourse around this, and of course, there are the outlets that will defend what uh, what this broadcaster was saying, and, and those that are trying to demonize him for saying it, and John Pilger is supporting him, and things like that. Kind of what you would expect, I, I, I would say. But um, what's the actual kind of sentiment on the ground there? I'm imagining this is still a fairly socially unacceptable thing to be talking about in in mixed company in australia yeah yeah absolutely this is this is not something you would go to uh you know the local pub or the local meet together and kind of be confident to to bring up openly without some kind of either verbal retribution or even i would say some some kind of physical retribution for it you know this is a this is such a sensitive and touchy subject and it and, you know, there's the whole thing. I do understand and I do actually support uh, people getting together on a certain day of the year and remembering, you know, tragic events and people who've lost loved ones in wars that are up in, in the past, you know. But when you have this kind of narrow-minded, you know, we can never say anything bad about the Anzacs, it really just plays into the, into the, the state's hand and, and it makes, you know, Questioning uh, the actions of our, of our soldiers and of and of the uh, governments who send them to conflicts that much more difficult, you know. So, I was always told in school that you know the Anzacs and the Diggers they fought for our lifestyle here in Australia and, and for freedoms and for freedom of speech. That includes freedom of speech of people you may not agree with and perspectives you may not agree with, but still, it's it still has to be protected and defended all the same. I absolutely agree. Um, we absolutely have to have the space to critique any cultural institution. There has to be, exist that space, um, and people have to not be thrown in jail for it, at the very least. I don't know about uh, trying to protect people's jobs. That's obviously up to companies, but people can apply pressure to the companies directly. Well, it's it's interesting to see, but unfortunately, as I say, it's not, uh, it's not a limited phenomenon that we see this going on all around the world, and that's probably only rising as military expenditures continue to be at near record levels, as uh, one of the latest reports from uh, CIPRI came out uh, just uh, recently to... to uh, nominate. And uh, I just wrote about that in the International Forecaster for people who are interested. Sadly, just business as usual for the uh, the, the war business, who uh, the war profiteers who, of course, literally engorge and en enlarge themselves on the back of these types of myths that are surrounding Anzacs and all the other military forces. So uh, business as usual for the military industrial complex. Yeah. And, you know, if people are looking for historical examples of why it is so important to have as open a public dialogue as possible, then you need to just look at the war in Vietnam, and which, of course, we were all told and sold a lie to get into in the first place. And, as, um, of course, this week marks the 40th anniversary of the end of that conflict, and still Agent Orange chemicals are being that were used in Vietnam have left a devastating effect on the entire country, you know. So there's, there's reasons that it's important to have as open a dialogue as possible in the, in the public arena and, you know... This guy losing his job, yeah, sure. I mean, that's neither here or there. But yeah, we need to encourage and foster, you know, uh, many, many different aspects to really gain a, a clearer perspective. And with that said, James, speaking of perpetuating more narratives, let's take our third and final story today from defensenews.com with the headline reading US and Japan strike new military agreement. The US and Japan agreed to a major update in their military relationship Monday one that is expected to lead to a greater global presence for Japan's military while strengthening ties between the two nations' cyber, space and industrial programs, according to a senior US defence official. Japan will be able to defend regional allies that come under attack, a change that means Japan's missile defence systems could be used to intercept any weapons launched towards the United States. Notable given its close proximity to North Korea, which the official later described as a growing threat to regional stability. In addition, expect to see increased Japanese presence around the globe on peacekeeping and humanitarian missions and potentially also on intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance operations. The guidelines will also lead to the establishment of a standing alliance coordination mechanism made up of Japanese and US officials from the defense and foreign relations sides. That body will provide a streamlined way of organizing and controlling US-Japan operations, something that has hindered the military relationship in the past. In essence, the guidelines codify the major changes to Japan's military structure laid out last summer by the government of Shinzo Abe. It points towards a Japan that sees itself as increasingly concerned about its ability to meet its security challenges in East Asia, 
particularly on how to cope with, the, and here's this meme again, a surging military power and dip, diplomatic confidence of China. James, as we said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And the threat of a rising China meme is one that has worked exceptionally well for all parties concerned. Uh, of course, we understand that this is just another piece being moved in position on the two-dimensional chessboard of the Asia Pacific. We've seen it coming for a couple of years, James, but sadly now Japan is a pacifist nation no more. That's pretty much the, uh, the, the long and short of it and whether or not the Japanese public want it or not. And I think there is a full court press going on right now to try to sell this change to the public. There is, of course, always a rabid, fervent, nationalist, militaristic segment of the population that willingly embraces this. But I, I think there's a large, a large percentage of Japanese who are very worried about the direction that this country is going in right now. So how can they be placated into submission as the, the constitution itself is basically starting to be undermined? And uh, all of these moves are being made to make J J Japan a militarily aggressive country again. Uh, well, uh, one example of that that I want to point out, um, it's a somewhat minor one, but I think it might be significant. As this is all happening and as Abe is in Washington to meet with Obama this week, it's interesting, just on Monday, he was uh, visiting the site of the Boston Marathon bombing. So uh, that was happening. And just a few hours later, back in Japan, near Tokyo, at a base, uh, the U.S. Army base Camp Zama, there was a report of an explosion in the early hours of Tuesday morning local time. The police went to investigate. They found two pipes of 2.5-inch diameter about uh, just under 800 meters away from the, 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 the fence of the, the camp itself. And they found a projectile in another field somewhere else, uh, out, again, outside of the base itself. And they've so basically, this is being framed in Stars and Stripes as a rocket attack. It sounds like a potato cannon to me. But anyway, this, uh, this news is breaking. And it's interesting that a lot of the coverage that's going on right now regarding this new agreement at least includes as a footnote, if nothing else, this rocket attack on Camp Zama that's happening by these radical left-wingers uh, that uh, that are probably associated with some someone calling themselves the Revolutionary Army, who've done this a couple of times in the past, and are supposedly associated, the police believe, are associated with a group called Kakuryokyo here, um, a, a radical leftist extremist group. So, how do you sell this type of war agenda to the public? It's always through false flags of one sort or another. Whether that's uh, staging an event like this, putting a couple of potato cannons in a field and saying, look, we're under attack by our own citizens. We have to clamp down on dissent. Or by uh, letting something like that happen, having a lax security around the base so that something can, can uh, take place like this. Either way, it sells it in the minds of the public who associate this event with that other event and it becomes wedded. Oh, there's some crazy leftist who are against this war agenda, but uh, we're not we're not part of that radical fringe group. We're the we're the no normal uh, people who are just going to accept this, and so I think that gets embedded into the psychology of this. It's only one data point in a million that are happening right now, but all of them are quite worrying. And in fact, we've had uh, recently uh, some of the charges that have been going on for a couple of years now that the Ob Abe government is really cracking down on the news media here, coming to a bit of a boil as an announcer quit live on air. No, he didn't actually quit, but he basically put his job. He basically quit. Um, he he was uh, calling out Abe on air for for stopping uh, the press from reporting on on the government, and he held up a sign, "I am not Abe" or something like that. "I am not with Abe," uh, live on air as he was uh, presenting. So uh, so millions of people were exposed to that. It caused quite a stir. It's interesting what's happening here, as uh, as people I think tend to th see Japan as a very staid conservative nation where people don't really get uh, get too worked up about things. But you have to remember, it was in 1960, you had those huge protests and riots trying to shut down the House, House of Representatives uh, in the Japanese Diet as they were trying to pass the, uh, the former J Japanese U.S. Security Cooperation Agreement, the AMPO. So, uh, so we've seen these types of huge riots and things happening in the past. We've seen large struggles that have been more or less suppressed in recent decades, but they may be coming back to the surface as this happens. So we'll have to see what the Japanese public reaction is to this latest development. But as you say, it's really just been, it's been a couple of years in the making, but I think it was a foregone conclusion since uh, Abe was re-elected in December. If only that uh, aforementioned uh, news reporter was an attractive woman who was working for Russia Today or something like that, his, his resignation would have been even louder, I, I suspect. But because, you know, he's, uh, he's working for one of the for one of the Team America, Team Japan, 
establishment uh, media outlets, then it's not so much. Um, James, just quickly before we wrap up today, I just wanted to put the call out there to the audience uh, for any interesting articles, stories, issues that are happening around the Asia Pacific that aren't related to China, United States, Australia or Japan. Obviously, we're, we're just two guys here. Uh, we, can't, we can't cover everything. So we would definitely like in future episodes to uh, shine a light on some of the lesser talked about parts of the Asia Pacific. So please uh, get in contact with either yourself or myself uh, with me at Brock West at, uh, at Brock West on Twitter or via the contact form on apperspective.net. And uh, yeah, if it's, if it's worth talking about, we'll definitely um, put it up in the next episode or two. Let's start a hashtag, uh, uh, Brock. Let's think about that. Hash AP perspective? I don't know. But at any rate, people can definitely use that to, uh, to suggest uh, story ideas and hopefully we'll get, uh, we'll get a good mix going and uh, perhaps we can even increase the, uh, the, the frequency of these uh, videos 